Hello, this is John Hodgson, and I'm going to be talking in the next few minutes with you about the use of IVUS for evaluating ambiguous lesions. Ambiguous angiograms pose a clinical challenge in that we need to quickly uh, gain a confident assessment of what is going on while minimizing contrast and radiation and determining the optimal treatment. In this regard, IVUS may help determine the plaque morphology, stent complications, or in some cases, the lesion severity. In my experience, there are a number of practical uses of IVUS for diagnosis in these types of ambiguous angiograms. I've listed four here, and I'm going to show you some examples of these in the next few slides. A few things to remember first. Blood flow is determined by the lumen area, not how much plaque is present. Therefore, we need to focus on measuring the lumen area when there is a question about flow limitation. IVUS can very easily define calcium and is much more sensitive than the angiogram for detecting the calcium. IVUS use is safe in all lesions. You should not hesitate to look with IVUS uh, before or after intervention or in diagnostic cases. And finally, it's important to remember that IVUS does not determine physiology. You should not use it to evaluate easily seen lesions. FFR is the correct tool for that. Let's start with filling defects. Often the question is whether it's calcium or thrombus or something else. Let me show you a few examples. This is a right coronary with a very subtle mobile filling defect in its mid portion in what otherwise looks like a fairly healthy vessel. In this case, Ivis finds a small thrombus basically floating on the edge of the vessel, but no real underlying pathology. The etiology for that is unclear. Uh, but no specific treatment was performed once we knew that there was no underlying lesion. This is a hazy angiogram of the proximal right coronary. It was actually felt to be thrombus and the patient was treated with thrombolytics and uh, prolonged heparin infusions and when the lesion did not change over several days finally intravascular ultrasound was performed and showed the image on your right which is a very heavily calcified nodule with marked uh, lumen distortion. Uh, the patient then went on to have rotational atherectomy and stenting, which would, of course, be the appropriate treatment. Here's another patient who returns three months after a balloon angioplasty of a left circumflex, and there's this hazy lesion seen in these two views in the proximal circumflex at the site of the previous dilatation. So the question, of course, is whether this is some sort of a complication of the PCI. IVUS will be excellent for looking at this. So here are the IVUS images. In your upper right is the proximal reference segment where you see some plaque at the left-hand border of the lesion, but a wide open uh, lumen. In your lower right is the distal reference, which is essentially a normal vessel. Then your two panels in the middle show the proximal and more distal aspect of this uh, hazy lesion. And in fact, what you can see is this is a large calcified plaque, which has been split during the previous intervention and is actually widely patent with no evidence of neointimal hyperplasia. This is an essentially a post-balloon plaque fracture which is healed very nicely. Let me outline the area in these two sections and I think you can appreciate the kidney bean shaped appearance in the more proximal section and the clear uh, dissected calcified plaque in the inferior picture. Here's another case during a, a primary PCI for an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. The original picture on your left shows the occluded mid left anterior descending. After this is opened and stented, there is a filling defect distally. 
shown inside the red circle. Often these are just uh, subject to another balloon dilatation or even stenting. However, uh, IVUS can help determine the actual etiology and more appropriately guide therapy. So here are the IVUS uh, images. The upper right image inside the previously placed stent shows that it is well opposed and expanded. The distal segment shows essentially a normal vessel with very minor plaque. And then in the defect, there is a homogeneous uh, lesion which is somewhat mobile and is sitting on top of an otherwise intact intima. This is most compatible with a thrombus. So the patient was therefore treated with repeat mechanical thrombectomy. With this uh, angiogram showing that the defect is now gone and this region was therefore spared from balloon inflation or stent placement. Here's a 60 year old woman with recurrent angina. She's had a previous stent in the mid left anterior descending and this filling defect is just proximal to that previously placed stent. This image is a blow up of these two uh, views showing this defect in the midsection here outlined with the red circles. Again this has the appearance of thrombus and the patient did have new onset of unstable angina but in my experience these lesions are often not thrombus but in fact calcium. So we did an intravascular ultrasound to further define this. And in fact, the IVUS shows a ruptured calcified nodule in that portion of the vessel. The patient then went on to receive another stent over this section of the progressed disease. Here's another woman who was undergoing preoperative evaluation for valve surgery. And as you can see, there is a linear filling defect in the proximal portion of the right coronary in what is uh, clearly a fairly patent vessel. Again, IVUS can clarify this abnormality and help determine whether any further treatment is necessary. In this case, the IVUS shows a wide open lumen, some mild placking, and a non-flow limiting dissection. You can see in all pictures that the lumen is widely patent and now with the red bars, I'll just highlight this little dissection flap. Seems to have been totally spontaneous. This vessel has never been uh, instrumented and uh, nothing needs to be done about this. And the surgeon is instructed to go ahead with the valve replacement and leave the coronaries alone. This is a young man who was very physically active and now presented with three days of a marked change uh, consisting of severe dyspnea and exertion at approximately 10 or 15 feet of walking. He had a normal EKG, a normal echo, normal biomarkers. He underwent catheterization. And you can see these large uh, vessels, but there is a small defect in the proximal portion of the left anterior descending as highlighted here in the yellow circles. So this underwent further evaluation. In this case, we did physiologic assessment, and both the FFR and the IFR measurements were indicating a non-ischemia producing lesion. However, the patient uh, clearly had uh, symptoms, and despite this, I was uh, continuing to have symptoms uh, while walking around on the ward. We therefore brought him back and repeated this with intravascular ultrasound. And you can see in this panel that he has large, fairly healthy vessels until this section where he has what appears to be a membrane separating two sections of the left anterior descending. Now you see the circumflex up at 11 o'clock and now we're back into the left main. When we look at this with chromaflow, 
in the right hand panel one can see the same thing with the flow disturbance there at this unusually uh, septated region of the left anterior descending. Now based on this, knowing that there was a clear anatomic defect there, and the fact that his symptoms were really quite severe and predictable, uh, and with really much trepidation, we determined to go ahead and put a stent in here. And this is a result after stenting and all of his chest pain and shortness of breath went away immediately. In fact, since we had done this through a radial approach, uh, I got him up off the cath lab table and walked him back to the ward where he was staying, walked around our circular ward four times at a brisk pace. He had absolutely no symptoms, and he's remained symptom-free ever since. The IVUS really uh, helped us to understand what was going on and to feel more confident in placing a stent in what otherwise looked like a fairly healthy vessel. Let's move to the uh, left main lesions. The primary issues here are whether there is in fact a lesion or if there is one, how severe is it? And this is the one uh, area of the vasculature where intravascular ultrasound is probably equivalent to fractional flow reserve for determining lesion severity. First, I'll just uh, start by saying we should never assume that a left main is significant by angiogram only. Obviously, there are some cases of very severe narrowing where the symptoms of the angiogram all fit. Uh, but occasionally, we have patients like this one where they have atypical chest pain, they've actually been referred for bypass surgery, but despite the angiographic appearance, the intravascular ultrasound of the left main is normal. And I actually have a number of cases that our surgeons have referred to me for an IVUS of the left main because they are not confident that the angiographic pictures clearly define a significant lesion. We've also had several patients with this appearance who've actually undergone bypass surgery and then had all their grafts closed, some of them going back for repeat bypass surgery just to have those grafts closed. And then finally, when an IVUS is done or their left main, it turns out they never had a lesion to begin with. It's important to know what a normal left main should be like. Um, the group in Rochester, Minnesota, looked at 121 patients with uh, normal left main coronaries and measured the IVUS cross-sectional area, found that the mean is over 16 square millimeters, and the lower limit of normal, in other words, the mean minus two standard deviations, is about 7.65 square millimeters. This is just over a three millimeter diameter vessel. So normal left mains are about five to six millimeters in diameter, and the lower level of normal is larger than three millimeters in diameter. So when we are looking at uh, vessels, we need to keep this in mind. The vessel may not have a stenosis, but if the absolute cross-sectional area is low, it can still be flow limiting. So there's two angiograms from a patient who has a clear uh, proximal LED lesion. However, I was not sure about the distal portion of his left main or the ostium of the LAD. And I'll show you that here in these blow-up pictures. The green uh, circle is over the clear uh, proximal LAD lesion. The yellow circle shows this uh, haziness at the ostium of the LAD. And then particularly in the AP cranial view on the right, this indentation with calcium in the distal left main. So prior to just stenting the left anterior descending, I felt it was prudent to investigate the entire region to ensure that the patient wouldn't be better served by a revascularization involving his left main. So here's the intravascular ultrasound pullback from the LED through into the left main with the chromaflow on, and you can clearly see lots of calcification lots of disease, which is of course not unexpected. 
but when one actually measures the lumen area, which will determine the blood flow, one has these findings. So in the osteal portion of the LED, you can see the lumen area is just over six square millimeters, and there is a large amount of bulky plaque from about seven o'clock up through 12 o'clock. As we pull back into the distal portion of the left main, a very oval-shaped eccentric lesion with heavy calcification, but the lumen area there is eight square millimeters, still quite sufficient for adequate blood flow. So both of these uh, lumens are clearly diseased, but sufficiently patent for good blood flow. So we were confident in going on and treating the focal proximal LED lesion and leaving these two areas alone. There's another gentleman with a very positive stress test, but on his angiography, there's this cleft-like uh, appearance of the osteal left main. Again, an easy place to investigate with IBIS, and the IBIS in this case shows a widely patent vessel uh, over six millimeters in diameter, and this is just an angiographic abnormality that has uh, no clear narrowing of the left main. We could therefore go on and treat his other focal lesions uh, that were actually causing his angina. Somewhat of a similar case here, although uh, this patient's positive stress test in angina turned out to be from his left main. So one can see a much smaller overall vessel, only three millimeters in diameter, with a minimal cross-sectional area at the distal left main of only 4.8 square millimeters. So this patient, in fact, needed uh, bypass surgery to treat his distal left main lesion. The correlation between IVUS and FFR has been studied in not only non-left main lesions, but also in left main lesions. Here is a study from uh, JASTI in 2004, which showed that the optimal differentiation between lesions with a low FFR and those with a non-ischemic FFR was approximately 5.9 square millimeters. And this is why we typically use six square millimeters as a cutoff for physiologic significance in the left main. Similarly, it's important to realize that IVUS is best for determining who does not need a left main intervention rather than trying to rule in patients who should be treated. That is shown in this uh, study where the minimal lumen area within the left main was again correlated with FFR. And one can see that if the minimal lumen area is greater than six square millimeters, it's very unlikely that the patient will have a physiologically abnormal FFR. On the other hand, when the lumen area is less than six square millimeters, many patients still have good blood flow and an FFR which is above the ischemic threshold. So IVUS is great for ruling out lesions, but not ruling in lesions that need treatment. Let's move on to some peristent issues. These revolve usually around dissection, uncovered plaque, spasm, or intramural hematomas. Intramural hematoma has a very characteristic uh, IVUS appearance. The uh, angiogram will also have a very smooth lesion. It is either proximal or distal to the stent, and it can certainly propagate and is, I think, the most common cause of acute vessel closure about one to two hours after a stent has been placed. The uh, ultrasound appearance is also very characteristic, usually a D-shaped uh, very homogeneous collection of blood, which is in the vessel wall between the media and the adventitia, uh, as you can see here. And note the difference between this uh, highlighted section and the plaque on the opposite wall, which is in fact standard atherosclerotic calcified plaque with an acoustic shadow. This is a 45-year-old man who had three vessel uh, coronary disease, was being treated uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, 
this is a IBIS image pullback from his uh, distal LED through uh, the lesion in the proximal section and into the left main. And you can see in the upper right hand side that his uh, LED is about three millimeters in diameter with a minor plaque. At the site of the uh, lesion, the uh, lower right panel, uh, there's a um, homogeneous hazy appearance to the entire lumen, which I think in retrospect was likely uh, thrombus on top of an ulceration or a fissure. The um, osteal portion of the LED is uh, widely patent with just some minor plaque. And then the uh, left main has a large crescentic plaque in the upper uh, right portion, uh, but again, a wide open lumen with uh, nearly four millimeters uh, diameter. So based on these images, a uh, three millimeter stent was implanted in that proximal left anterior descending. And then subsequently, uh, we went on to move the wire to the circumflex, treated another lesion there. Uh, after each of these stent implantations, we did uh, repeat IVUS to look at stent expansion. And then uh, in retrospect, when uh, the ario caudal view was again taken, there was a uh, linear defect in the inferior aspect of the left main. And I've now pieced together the uh, pre-angiogram of the distal left main in the upper right the, uh, excuse me, the pre-IVUS in the upper right, the uh, IVUS that was obtained after the LED stent in the lower left, in the center on the bottom, the IVUS pictures obtained after the circumflex stent, and in both of these uh, images after the stents, you can see this subintimal hematoma in the upper right-hand section of the image. There's a, a little black uh, line separating the pre-existing intima from the adventitia, and then a large collection of uh, homogeneous blood uh, underneath that. There is, of course, some degree of luminal compromise, uh, and this was uh, back in 1997, so left main stenting was uh, clearly not uh, in vogue at that time. And uh, we watched the patient for two hours. He had widely patent vessels, no ischemia, normal EKG, and uh, none of us really wanted to take him uh, to surgery. And after two hours, you can see that his left main still remained widely patent. And so we left the sheath in, uh, actually brought him back the next morning. And then these are uh, the angiograms that we had of that same uh, left main region. So in the upper left, the pre-angiogram, and the lower left, that angiogram that alerted us to uh, something being abnormal. In the upper right, the angiogram from the following morning at 18 hours, um, and you can see that was totally healed. Uh, at that point, uh, he was discharged home. He returned to the emergency room about three days later, and of course, uh, we were quite concerned. He went right to the cath lab, and uh, his 72-hour angiogram on the lower right, uh, again, shows that the left main is widely patent and still appears unchanged. And at that time, when we took the AP cranial view on the far right of your picture, you could now see a little bit of dye staining where there was a proximal edge dissection from the LED stent, and this now explains uh, where this entomal hematoma originated from. And as you can see here, now it is sealed off, the left main is healed, and um, this patient then went on to do very well with no uh, further treatment. So another patient who has uh, recurrent chest pain 12 hours after an angiographically guided LED stent and uh, it was placed in that proximal LED. He brought, brought back to the cath lab and had intravascular ultrasound, which is my recommendation for all stent issues. And what you're going to see on the right-hand panel is a napkin ring of calcium. And the still image that you're seeing there is actually the unexpanded stent in a severely calcified uh, vessel. And this is the appearance in the middle of his proximal LED stented lesion. So I'll now let this uh, image play. This is in the distal vessel, calcified, but open and no stent at that point. Now we're going to move back into the stent.
there, and then very quickly we hit that napkin ring of calcium, and then back out of it and into the left main. So it's just a very short segment of a very severely calcified lesion which impaired stent expansion. And interestingly enough, the balloon inflation looks absolutely normal. Because if you are not exactly perpendicular to the balloon, the proximal and distal portions of the balloon will overlap each other and you will not see the very focal indentation in the balloon. So the, in, the uh, balloon inflation appearance uh, can be misleading in this case. So we had to go back and try to re-expand this stent. So here is after a three and a quarter balloon at 16 atmospheres. And if you watch the IVUS on the right, you'll see as we pull back through the lesion, the distal section of the stent is now more expanded there. But as we come into that original lesion, it's still very, very narrowed. In fact, we've just done very minimal expansion in that section. Again, proximally and distally, it's looking better, but in that midsection, it is still severely underexpanded. So we went back with a three and a half millimeter balloon. Again, the balloon looks fully expanded, but again, on IVUS, that middle section of the lesion is still underexpanded. So I show you this case just to remind you to always uh, consider calcium and to be very wary of it uh, before you put a stent in. So these calcified lesions are often missed on the angiogram and they have a huge impact on stent expansion. As you can see here, after a fair amount of work with oversized balloons and high pressure, and in fact I didn't show you, but we also did um, two balloons side by side at 28 atmospheres trying to further expand this. Uh, and on the bottom you can see how we started and what we ended up with, which was still underexpanded for this degree of stent. And so our only uh, option at that point was to have the patient continue on dual antiplatelet agents and uh, really to hope that things went well. So always uh, look for calcium first so that you don't end up in this type of a situation with an unexpandable stent. Here's another uh, hazy angiogram in a patient with acute coronary syndrome. He's had a prior stent running from the posterior descending artery across the crux and into the distal right coronary. You can see now this hazy region down by the crux has the appearance of thrombus. And as we do with all stent complications, uh, we're going to look at this with intravascular ultrasound. And if we start in the lower right-hand panel now in the midsection of the posterior descending, you can see really a pretty healthy vessel. It's about three millimeters in diameter. As we come back towards the uh, ostium of the PDA in the upper right, you see a nicely opposed uh, stent. And then we have two sections into the main body of the distal right where the stent is not opposed. And then in the lower left, you can see the proximal reference, which is about three and a half millimeters in diameter. So here are those unopposed stent struts. And I suspect what happened here was uh, that this uh, stent slid proximally on the balloon as it was being delivered into the PDA so that this proximal portion of the stent was never fully expanded by the balloon. Uh, alternatively, it was a relatively small stent, and when the post-dilatation was done, only the distal portion of it was post-dilated. In any case, it was put in with angiographic guidance, and the operators never recognized that it was uh, so badly malopposed. The fix here, of course, is uh, relatively easy. You just need a repeat balloon inflation. We were lucky enough that the original wire passage had actually gone inside the stent, but had it not, um, one could also have used IVUS to help guide the wire back inside the stent so that you could do a proper balloon inflation and re-expand the stent. So let's finish up with these uninterpretable or very misleading angiograms, which are I think just as bad as the ambiguous angiograms because you're really not sure what you can't see. So here's a very misleading angiogram 
After stent placement, this proximal LED looks wonderful by angiogram. However, when you do the IVUS pullback, you find these unopposed struts that are not visualized on the angiogram. So this is not uncommon. I just showed you another case of that, uh, especially if the vessel has a tapering appearance or a reverse taper and you are not uh, appropriate in choosing the stent size to begin with. So if you are guessing at the stent size, uh, you may end up with a number of uh, situations like this. And if you don't do IVUS afterwards, you will miss them. It's another case uh, of a very nice angiographic result on the left. This was a long stent placed in the uh, left anterior descending. Um, it was quite a difficult lesion. It was a difficult stent passage and eventually uh, got it down through the lesion and inflated it. And now this is the follow-up IVUS. Again, the angiogram looks uh, very well, but uh, the proximal portion of the LED shows good uh, stent uh, apposition and expansion. However, as the uh, IVUS is pulled back into the left main, you can see there's a unrecognized, unexpanded stent in the left main and the uh, yellow arrows are pointing to that unexpanded stent. And in this case, uh, we're confident that what happened was that the stent did slide back on the balloon as it was being negotiated through the tight lesion in the LED, so that when the uh, stent balloon was expanded, the proximal portion of the stent, which at that point was in the left main, uh, never was uh, expanded by the balloon. And again, since this operator was diligent about doing uh, IVUS in this case, uh, this was recognized and uh, the proximal portion and left main was then post dilated to oppose it. Uh, obviously, the case was not intended to be a left main stent, but certainly better to have recognized it and taken care of it uh, than to have left an unexpanded stent floating in the left main uh, to cause mischief in the future. This is another type of uh, difficult angiogram. There is a, a chronic total occlusion of the LED. It's flush occluded at the takeoff of this large diagonal that you can see in the spider view. And uh, in this case, the IVUS can be very useful to figure out where that ostium actually is. There's another view in the AP cranial. And again, you can see the LED ghosting in here in the, in the middle by left to left collaterals. But the exact origin from the branching diagonal is uh, somewhat unclear. Now, this is a wonderful use for IVUS. You can put a wire into the diagonal, run the IVUS into the diagonal, and very slowly go back and forth until you see what you see here at 3 o'clock, the large occluded left anterior descending. So once you have this, you know exactly where the uh, takeoff is because you can see the imaging portion of the catheter. And then we can use the IVUS to actually guide the cap penetration. In this case now, the IVUS is still in the diagonal and you can see a second wire going out into this totally occluded LED. That's the very bright echo you see there at about 3 o'clock. So in real time, you can guide the wire into the occluded LED cap. After that, you can move the IVUS to the LED wire and confirm that the uh, wire, in fact, was intraluminal, and in this case, clearly plaque all around the uh, LED catheter now with a nice transition into the more proximal LED, and you see the second wire there, which is now sitting in the diagonal. Once you've confirmed all of that, made your measurements, it's quite easy then to do a stent placement and end up with a very nice uh, result. And then confirm that, of course, with your post IVUS, looking for stent expansion, apposition. And in this case, uh, it's a crossover stent, goes over the diagonal there and back into the more proximal portion of the LED. There are other uh, side branch issues that are difficult to sort out on the angiogram. So this is after a stent placement in a main vessel in another patient. And now the diagonal ostium appears narrowed. Uh, 
Um, there are many studies now that show that these focal osteo lesions are often not flow limiting and that they really should be assessed further with physiology before any uh, treatment is contemplated. In this case, the stent was being guided by IVUS, so we can often get some information from the IVUS run. Here we can see the stent and the large plaque behind it, as well as in the beginning of this run, when it comes up again, we're going to see the diagonal there at 7 o'clock. appears to be widely patent. It was appearing down in this section. So we can investigate that further by using chromaflow, which will show where the um, blood flow movement is. Here's the chromaflow picture. And again, you can see good blood flow into that diagonal, shown by the uh, yellow arrow here. And then just to confirm that this is physiologically not important, um, FFR can be measured in the diagonal. In this case, it's 0.86 confirming that this is unlikely to result in any type of ischemia, and we can leave this uh, diagonal osteum alone. There's another case, uh, post-bypass patient, needed revascularization of his circumflex. However, the takeoff of the circumflex from this left main LED is seen in this uh, leocaudal and areocaudal views is quite unclear. So we can use the ultrasound again to find out where that osteum is. So here's the ultrasound catheter over a wire in the LED. The upper panel shows the sort of distal portion of the left main with a little bit of the LED at the upper right. The lower panel shows the uh, more calcified fibrotic portion of the left main. And there in the green circle is that occluded circumflex osteum. So once we know where that is, you can then uh, go ahead and direct a, a wire into that and eventually open up that chronic occlusion. One last case, uh, one of my uh, favorite patients. This is a 57-year-old man who had onset of angina while playing racquetball. He uh, went home, uh, wasn't feeling well, sitting on the couch, and had a cardiac arrest. His uh, son had just studied CPR in high school, he did CPR. EMS came and defibrillated him, and he was uh, brought emergently to the cath lab. When he arrived, he actually had a laceration on his forehead. Uh, they thought he might have been injured during a fall or during the accident. It turns out, in retrospect, he was injured while playing racquetball. His partner had hit him in the head with the racket. Um, his CT was negative. That delayed things a little bit. By the time he got into the cath lab, his EDP was 25, and these were his angiograms. So he's got a uh, widely patent right coronary. There's some very faint collateralization up to the uh, LED there. And then uh, in the ileocaudal, you can see a flush occlusion of the LED with a uh, high obtuse marginal and uh, circumflex branches as the only things uh, left on the left circulation. So this lesion is crossed with some difficulty. Uh, a uh, transfer catheter was used to uh, inject distally and, and be sure that we were in the correct position. There was a lot of clot seen in the LED left main junction as you can see in that AP cranial view. Um, the patient was treated uh, with a glycoprotein inhibitor, uh, a antithrombin, and aspirin, and uh, a balloon pump was placed uh, due to the uh, location of the lesion, his uh, elevated uh, end diastolic pressure, and uh, falling blood pressure. Here again is the distal injection just to confirm we're in the right spot. Really couldn't get any antegrade flow through there. And then on the right, you can see that filling defect in the proximal portion of the LED. So he has a balloon pump. Uh, he gets a thrombectomy catheter used, and these are his angiograms now after a little bit of stabilization. And uh, it was after the thrombectomy a little bit unclear exactly where the lesion was. And I'll just play these two. And there's clearly a little something going on in that proximal LED, but certainly doesn't look like a severe uh, lesion there.
especially in that AP cranial view. So we pulled out our IBIS. You can see from the um, timestamp here, this is uh, 1030 at night. And um, what we're going to find is shown in this still frame, which is a little uh, ulcerated fissure up there between 9 and 10 o'clock. And um, that's going to be the lesion. It was a little uh, plaque rupture. Uh, there was a subsequent thrombosis on top of that. We've obviously removed the thrombus now. And my question is, where is this lesion? And as I let this play, I want you to think about that. Could be in the osteo LED. It could be in the distal left main, could be in the proximal LED. And that's really the question that we have to answer so that we know how to best treat him, where should we put this stent. So as we're pulling back now from the LAD, got a little uh, septal there, prox LED here. Pretty soon we're going to see the circumflex there on the right. Now into the left main. And then ultimately out into the sinus of Valsalva. Let us play that again. Now we're in the LED distally. Got some concentric plaque here in the prox LED. Circumflex is going to come in at 3 o'clock. And then we'll be in the left main. So I hope that most of you recognize that the lesion was actually in the uh, distal left main. And the prox LED was fairly free of disease. And in fact, I think the lesion had ulcerated. And then he had had a thrombus propagate into the uh, LED. So after much uh, thought, we decided just to finish with a balloon. It was a two-atmosphere balloon. In fact, I can't tell you exactly why we did that. Uh, left the balloon pump in for 48 hours. He had full neurologic recovery. His acute ejection fraction was 30%. He had no further cardiac symptoms for the next 48 months. His EF improved to 55%. And these are his uh, final angiograms. So in this patient, uh, the IBIS really helped us locate where the lesion was, and in this case, determined not to stent at all. And um, the patient has done remarkably well. So here he is in the center. That's me in the middle behind him. The patient's in the center there. His name is Mel Jones. He knows that I use his name. And I had the great pleasure to see him 11 years later. Here he is, just a couple years ago now. Obviously still doing well. He's never been back in the hospital. Continues to do great on his medical treatment. This guy now uh, living quite well, just after a simple balloon inflation, uh, no stents, and all of that guided by intravascular ultrasound. So I've been asked to show you what uh, my workflow is for these kinds of ambiguous angiograms. And I really define that as anything you cannot readily explain or whenever you consider taking more views or getting another opinion, that's a great time to think about doing IVIS just to find out exactly what's going on. So once you're looking at that, you really have two groups of patients. You have the de novo patients where you're going to image the defect after you anticoagulate fully. And you're going to be assessing for whether there's a lesion, uh, whether it's calcium, what's the lumen area, uh, and then you will determine whether treatment is needed, in which case you'll cycle back up to the treatment options based on the IBIS data, or whether you're finished, in which case the angiograms are over. Now, if uh, it's a post-stent patient, then again, your treatment options are going to be based on the IBIS data, but now you're really looking for restenosis, malapposition, dissections, underexpansion, maybe a wire through the side uh, cell of a stent, uh, and then you're going to make a decision about what needs to be done, and then re-image. And I think it's important to re recognize that in any of these cases, you really want to measure that minimal stent area, because that's what's going to determine how adequately that stent uh, result will be. Um, if you're 
treatment is successful, um, then you're done. If your treatment shows that uh, it still doesn't look very good, then you, of course, retreat and uh, re-image with IVUS, like I've showed you on some of these calcified lesions, uh, until you get the result that, uh, that will give the patient a good outcome. So in conclusion, uh, IVUS imaging allows the determination of the presence of a lesion, the lesion composition, particularly calcium, and the potential need for treatment. IVUS detects problems that are not apparent on the angiogram, and I think it's important to recognize that there are certain situations where we always should image because the angiogram is just unreliable and we can't see the issues that IVUS can pick up. Um, IVUS imaging can certainly determine the abnormalities associated with stent failure and suggest appropriate treatment. And finally, it's my view that IVUS should be performed routinely so that the operator is familiar with image interpretation and really comfortable in recognizing normal from abnormal findings. And that way, when they have an unusual cir cir circumstance, they'll be able to put in the IVUS and very quickly sort out what the issue is. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I hope this has uh, been helpful.